Hey guys, before we get started with the video, I want to take the time to thank our sponsor once again, Tipsy Sake. As we start moving into the holiday season, one of the things I enjoy the most is sharing festive beverages with family and friends. And now, thanks to Tipsy Sake who have broadened my sake palette ever further, sake itself will be something that I am looking forward to bringing to my holiday gatherings. Right now, Tipsy is running a deal on their holiday collection for 2022, slashing prices on a number of bottles as well as including a free Tenugui towel with your order if you use the code HOLIDAY2022. However, besides having a great selection for the holidays, I also would like to take the time to bring up that Tipsy doesn't just sell sake, but also sake ware. Tipsy partners with local craftsmen in Japan to provide you with beautifully handcrafted sake ware. This month I was sent the Fubuki set with hand basket, made by Hirota Glass in Tokyo. This set comes with two mesmerizingly blue cups, a carafe, and of course the hand basket, allowing you to serve sake to guests and even yourself in a truly authentic manner. This just continues to show how great of a service Tipsy Sake is, helping connect you to the fascinating world of sake. And of course, I also have a personal promo code for you to use this month, Shogunate NOV for November, which will give you 15% off on all products. You can find the link and promo code listed down below. As always, I cannot recommend Tipsy Sake enough for being your go-to source for all of your sake needs. Just remember to please drink responsibly and obey your country's laws on the purchasing of alcohol. And with that said, let's get on to the video. When you think about clothing in pre-modern Japan, there are certainly a lot of unique images that probably pop into your head. Yet one that is extremely distinctive has to be the footwear. Footwear in Japan has always been an incredibly interesting topic to me. Now, normally, when we think about footwear in Japan, it is pretty common for our brains to immediately jump to one thing. Sandals. Of course, sandals were not the only type of footwear in pre-modern Japan, as there were all sorts of unique styles of boots and other things we can start to classify as more of a formal idea of a shoe. But it does appear that sandals of varying designs would have been the most common, which then raises the question of why? Well, the most common answers I have seen point in the direction of Japan's hot climate, making sandals much more ideal than normal covered shoes. But also, the fact that footwear is generally removed upon entering most buildings in Japan, sandals just make it easier to quickly slip them off and on you go. Yet it does raise a further interesting question regarding the samurai, pre-modern Japan's warrior class. What types of footwear would the samurai have worn? And in particular, which ones would have been the most practical for actual battle? In this video, we will try to answer that question while also discussing a number of Japanese footwear designs that were relevant in pre-modern Japan, specifically among the samurai. Yet first, I need to address that this video is being made in collaboration with two other channels. If we remember back a few months, I made several videos regarding samurai helmets and face masks alongside the two channels Samurai and Ninja History and Sengoku Studies. Here today, I am back with them to do the same, as each of them have this month already put out two fantastic videos detailing the history of samurai footwear. However, I also really should mention that Shogo has made a great video on this topic too. Down below, I will leave links to all of their videos so you can deepen your understanding of this fascinating subject regarding pre-modern Japanese footwear. But as for this video, let's briefly start out by recapping some of the types of footwear that existed throughout Japanese history. To begin, let's talk about the Waraji. This style of sandal was very simple and usually made of straw. And although it was corded between the toes, it was also tied on around the ankle. The initial emergence of the Waraji is believed to have been from somewhere between the Nara period and into the Heian period. Being that it was such a humble design, it was commonly worn by members of the lower classes, but also by warriors. To this end, they would have been worn with bare feet, but also they could be worn with tabi, split-toed socks. Most notably, it would become the primary form of footwear worn by Ashigaru foot soldiers and samurai during the years of the Sengoku period. The next design I want to look at is a famous one called Geta. In my mind, this is the design I always think about when I picture Samurai Jack. The Geta was a wooden sandal that was more in the flip-flop style we know of today. However, one very distinctive feature of the Geta were the platforms, or teeth, that jut out from underneath, propping the wearer up. 
There are various lengths that these teeth could be, creating unique subcategories of geta. The purpose of these teeth seem to have been to make sure that the wearer's garments do not drag on the ground, but also to keep the wearer out of mud if the ground is wet. It appears that the overall style of the geta may have emerged far back into ancient China, and simply found its way to Japan over the years. However, different from the waraji was that the design does not seem to be one you would have found on the battlefield. Not only could it be viewed as a more delicate style, but also one that could be far more clumsy to the wearer thanks to its teeth. This could result in a negative effect on the wearer's balance during a heated engagement, and thus I imagine it would not have fared well in combat. On the other hand, it was still a design that Ronin would have certainly worn, as is depicted in numerous portrayals. Yet a Ronin who may frequently find himself engaged in duels would likely not have favored the Geta, but instead the more utilitarian Waraji. Another interesting design that stems off from the Waraji, but was far less crude, was that of the Zori. The Zori was a far more elegant style, and usually one which has been seen to be worn in more formal attire. It was also not always made from straw, and other versions came to exist with newer features and materials, such as lacquered wood and leather soles. Truly, this may have become the most advanced style of sandal that would ever come to exist in pre-modern Japan. Now, one thing that each of these designs have in common is that, like I had been mentioning, each of them could be worn with tabi, split-toed socks. Tabi are unique because not only could they be worn with these various styles of sandals, but also there would eventually come to be tabi that could be simply worn independently too. These are forms of tabi that were made with thicker leather as to protect the wearer from the roughness of the ground. These would become very popular and are known to have been worn from everyone from farmers to samurai. Yet of course, as others have already pointed out, the tabi design is one that people also like to really associate with our modern pop culture image of the ninja. So, altogether, these sandals and tabi are the core of what samurai would have mainly worn, with of course the ones I mentioned so far, waraji and tabi being the only two that would have been seen on the battlefield. As, like I mentioned, the geta would have been far too clumsy, and the zori much too formal. Not to mention that they could have both easily have fallen off in the heat of the moment, while Waraji and Tabi would have firmly stayed attached to the foot. But there is one element I have not touched on yet in this video. That being armor. What would a fully armored samurai have worn on their feet? Well, in most cases, they too would have likely stuck with the Waraji and Tabi. But two footwear designs I have not talked about yet were specific for a fully armored samurai. These being Kegutsu and Kogake. First off, let's examine the Kegutsu. This was an ornate design consisting of leather and fur that completely covered the foot. Both Antony and Scott went into great detail regarding this design in their videos, and it is important to note that it is a very early design, likely worn throughout the Heian period by a lord in his Oyoroi great armor. However, because they were worn by a lord, they would not likely have actually been worn into battle itself, and rather would have just been what the lord would have worn while issuing commands and even during a later head viewing ceremony. This style appears to have largely faded away as time went on, which eventually leads us to the Kogake, which fits much better into the more modern style of samurai armor that would emerge throughout the Sengoku period and onward. The Kogake is actually usually described as a form of tabi. It is essentially an armored foot covering. There are multiple styles of these, ranging from just being covered in chainmail, known as kusari, to more protective designs featuring full metal plating. This would have absolutely been what a samurai would have ideally wanted to wear into battle, and would have been the most protective form of footwear that would emerge in pre-modern Japan. However, what is interesting about the kogake is that it appears that this style may not have actually emerged until the Edo period, after the warring Sengoku era had ended. Thus, although this seems like it would have been the most useful samurai footwear for battle, it may have never seen any real warfare. Either way, these were all the main forms of footwear that I wanted to touch on here today, specifically because they all relate to the samurai. Obviously, there are way more forms of Japanese footwear that I did not get into here. But with that said, of the designs I mentioned, which one do you like the most? Which design would you like to have worn? 
As I brought up earlier, please be sure to check out the videos from Samurai and Ninja History, Sengoku Studies, and of course Shogo to dive deeper into this fascinating subject. And lastly, I would like to once again thank Tipsy Sake for sponsoring this video. You can find the link and promo code down below. Don't miss out on this amazing offer from the best sake service there is. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.